in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, highlights from Samsung Unpacked. The smartphone maker debuts its most extensive lineup of devices, taking aim at Apple and rising competition from China. Plus, Tesla's revolving door, its general counsel is leaving the company after just two months on the job. Is 2019 shaping up to be just as agonizing as last year for CEO Elon Musk? And Apple streamlining its app store. How does the move fit into the overall strategy to gain more revenue from its services business? But first to our top story, the wait is over. At the Samsung Unpacked event, the company unveiled the biggest redesign of its marquee Galaxy smartphone in San Francisco. The South Korean tech giant introduced four new phones on Wednesday, taking on Apple with new low-end premium models, 3D cameras, and in-screen fingerprint scanning capabilities, along with 5G connectivity. Part of the revamp is a foldable phone. The Galaxy Fold has a 4.6-inch screen, when used as a phone and can unfold to a tablet with a 7.3 inch screen, allowing users to use up to three applications at once. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who was at the event. So Mark, how excited are you about a foldable phone and the rest of this lineup? Well, you know, the most you know eye-popping part about this is the price point for that foldable phone. This is going to be the first mass market folding phone we've seen. And the price is about $2,000. It's $1,980, which would make it the absolute most expensive name brand phone on the market. So uh, talk to us about what specifically you see will be a real competitor to Apple here. I think on the hardware side, what Samsung is coming out with is quite impressive. For the flagship models, aside from the foldable, it's four devices. There's one 5G device at the high end, which means Samsung is going to be at about a year and a half advantage over Apple and 5G, based on our reporting. Also a low-end phone, the S10e, to take on the iPhone XR. It actually looks similar to the XR. And some of the advancements they have in the camera space seem pretty impressive as well. But I've had a chance to use some of the phones in, in recent days, and while the hardware seems ahead of Apple at least one to two years in terms of some of the camera technology, 3D sensing, and of course 5G, I still think Apple's ahead on the software side and the services integration. Right, and you've reported that Apple isn't working on 5G at least this year, but maybe it'll come next year, we don't know. Do you think that 5G capability will really be a draw for consumers this year? I think so in terms of the marketing prowess and pushes we're seeing from companies like Verizon and AT&T. Will there be enough people this year in the U.S. to take advantage of 5G? It's not clear, but at least by the first half of 2020, 5G is going to be in a lot of markets across the U.S. The problem for Apple is that the company usually releases its new phones around September, October, and November of every calendar year. So unless Apple pushes their iPhone release up in 2020 or comes out with a specialized 5G version earlier in the year, they're going to be at least six months or so behind on 5G. All right, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman for us at the Samsung Unpacked event. Thanks so much, Mark, for that update. I want to stick with Samsung and bring in John Butler of Bloomberg Intelligence. John, would you agree with uh, what Mark had to say there in terms of his evaluation of these new products? Yeah, you know, I think the new products look terrific, Emily. I really was surprised at the quality of the screens, the fingerprint technology, all that I think makes Samsung very competitive. I think the one thing to keep in mind here, though, is that they're really not competing with Apple with these phones, in my view, as much as they're competing with sort of these rising Chinese vendors that have very, very good devices at really low price points. So what do you think will convince consumers to upgrade? I mean, we know in general that the smartphone market is slowing. You know, what do these products offer that you know, prior phones don't? Phones are lasting longer. People just don't need to upgrade. So why do it? I think that's a problem that we're going to live with for a while in this industry. And you can see it reflected in the shipment decline we saw this year with um, roughly a 4 to 5% decline in the market in 2018. 
I think the next big push to upgrade is likely to be 5G. I think the foldable phone introduced by Samsung today is a move in the right direction, but I'm not sure it quite gets them there in terms of sparking upgrade activity. So how does this position Samsung to compete with the Chinese handset makers, which are offering often at cheaper prices, half price or even less, phones that some would say work just as well? Well, I mean, Samsung right now has been almost literally pushed out of the Chinese market by these vendors. So Xiaomi is on that list, Huawei, Vivo, Oppo, uh, all with great devices. But I think as you look more broadly across the world, there's a lot of behavior, buying behavior aimed at buying good quality devices with really good displays. I think the display is becoming more and more important as video traffic grows as a percent of the total mobile traffic out there. People really are migrating to video, and I think Samsung has an edge there with its displays. So how might you expect the market share chart, the global smartphone market share chart, to look different at the end of this year uh, than, say, it does right now? So Samsung, that's a great question. Samsung's share has been roughly flat for the past couple of years. And I think on the strength of this upgrade cycle, the introduction of the 10e, which is the lower price Galaxy, the foldable phone, I imagine you'll see their share trend up just a little bit. Uh, I suspect Apple's going to be stable to maybe down a little bit, uh, depending on what we see in September. And then with the Chinese vendors, sort of steady as she goes. All right. John Butler, Bloomberg Intelligence, appreciate your analysis there. Thank you so much. Coming up, is Elon Musk too fast to tweet? Another Twitter snafu on the part of the Tesla CEO, this time on the production rate. We will discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio anytime. This is Bloomberg. Tesla turnover continues. General counsel Dane Butzwinkis is leaving after just two months on the job. He's the Washington trial lawyer who represented Elon Musk last fall in his battle with the SEC. That legal battle was in regards to Musk's infamous tweet about taking Tesla private and having funding secured. Since, the SEC has kept a close watch on Musk's Twitter account, and now they might have more motive to take some kind of action. Turns out that Musk tweeted too soon, tweeting that the electric car maker would make about 500,000 vehicles this year. Just a few hours later, though, he revised that by tweeting, meant to say annualized production rate at the end of 2019, probably around 500,000, i.e. 10,000 cars per week. Deliveries for a year still estimated to be about 400,000. Joining us to discuss, Tasha Keeney, analyst at ARK Investments, also with us, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, who covers the company. So, Craig, how big a deal is this, given the SEC monitoring that supposedly has been going on? Well, the SEC isn't reacting uh, up to this point, and the company is saying it's still in compliance with the settlement that was agreed to late last year. Uh, but it does raise some questions to your point. Uh, so, so Musk was supposed to uh, really uh, have a, a system of, of pre-approval for tweets that would be considered material to the company. Obviously, uh, a 500,000 unit production uh, sort of forecast for this year uh, was uh, was sort of inconsistent with what the company had said previously. Interestingly enough, uh, Musk himself was uh, inconsistent even the day of earnings on January 30th, where he did give a, a figure of as much as 400,000 deliveries this year, and then a couple hours later on the earnings call uh, said that they maybe could deliver as many as 500,000 Model 3s. So Musk has, has been a little bit all over the, the place with sort of the outlook for this year from a production and delivery standpoint. Uh, and this was sort of a continuation of that. But clearly, the settlement with the SEC was supposed to guard against these sorts of things happening. And clearly, there was, there was an issue uh, in this particular case. Tasha, does this concern you? So, you know, in the, in the past, we've sort of heard um, Musk say similar things like this when he talked about the 5,000 uh, Model 3 production per week. You know, then he specified, OK, well, that's, you know, at, at, at a peak rate or at an, in this case, an annualized rate. Um, you know, I think... Uh, 
whether or not, um, I, I think in general, what this this focus on production, um, I, I think traditional analysts and certainly institutional investors put uh, way too much focus on it. Um, so, so our point of view on Tesla is that it's an autonomous electric vehicle company. Um, you know, this is sort of the long-term story that that we care about. Um, so, so you know, in talking about production and sort of hitting these specific targets, if they're off by a month or two, um, you know, that's not going to change the long-term thesis. Meantime, Craig, the general counsel leaving after just two months. There's an internal lawyer, Jonathan Chang, taking over this after Musk surprised investors by saying the CFO would be leaving earlier this year. What exactly happened here? We don't know much beyond uh, the sort of vague uh, reference to this being a poor cultural fit for Butswinkus. So um, at, at this point, you know, that that sort of is reminiscent of, of something that we heard from from some of the many uh, executives that departed last year. One executive who particularly uh, comes to mind is Justin McAneer, uh, who joined the, the company from Seagate and was supposed to be the, the chief accounting officer. And he left uh, just a couple months into his tenure as well and sort of talked about he, he sort of took for granted just how much attention there was on this company. I think with Butswinkus, you also had a, a situation where where he was sort of uprooting from Washington, where he's been a longtime lawyer and was moving to the West Coast uh, and, and sort of a, a focusing on this company on a full-time basis and sort of decided uh, decided against this. So it's unclear whether last night's tweets had anything to, to do with this. It uh, doesn't appear to be the case, but uh, it, it's also uh, ju just, you know, generally a, another indication that, you know, Elon Musk uh, may be a bit of a difficult person to work for. Tasha. You know, turnover is nothing new at, at Tesla, as Craig has mentioned, you know, but we're talking about key roles, the CFO, the general counsel, previously the head of HR. Does it concern you that he can't keep these roles filled? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'd agree that uh, Musk is a particular person to work for, and uh, you, you sort of need to jive with that style, I think, in order um, to be happy at Tesla. I think, um, well, let's let's talk about the CFO. In terms of the CFO leaving, um, that you could actually view as, you know, he, he came in um, during a difficult time at Tesla, and he felt like the company was ready to fly in its own, and that's why he was okay leaving again. Um, I think this particular departure, you know, actually when Butswinkus was bought, brought on, people were worried. They said, oh, you know, Tesla's probably going to get a lot of litigation. And now when he's, you know, leaving, there's, again, more worry. So it's, it's sort of like, okay, we'll pick one. Um, but I, I think in this particular case, you know, it, it could, as you said in the beginning, be sort of a, a sign that um, he didn't get that litigation he expected. He also said he's going to stay on um, in an outside counsel role with Tesla. So you'd think that if there was some sort of relationship damage that he might not want to do that. Now, on a podcast earlier this week, Musk made some interesting comments that might speak to both of these issues. He said, people think sometimes that I'm like a business person or a finance person or something like that. I'm an engineer. I do engineering, always have. The reason Tesla is making rapid progress is because we have vastly more data and this is increasing exponentially. Tasha, um, you know, t talk to us a little bit about what he said here in this podcast. So the podcast really focused on autonomous driving. And again, um, we, we did that with a purpose because we're long-term investors, and, and that's the, the picture that we see ahead of Tesla. Um, you know, our, our bull case price target is $4,000 on the stock in five years, and, and most of that is due to autonomous. So um, what Musk is talking about here is Tesla's data advantage. It's something that we focused on for a long time. They're the only automaker collecting data off of their customer cars on the road. Um, that gives them this incredible long tail of events that really no one else has. You know, Waymo just published uh, reports in California along with the rest of the companies testing there on this intervention rate. And you can see that, you know, Waymo at cumulatively has about 10 million miles as of October of last year. Tesla has uh, billions of miles in autopilot. In fact, roughly 8 billion, uh, we think, with hardware one and hardware two cars driven today. So, so that's an amazing advantage. That's what's going to get them across the finish line to autonomous driving. Um, so in, in that case, it's important to have an engineer at the helm of the company that understands that and is willing to invest in that opportunity. Tasha, this was on a podcast with you. Were you satisfied with the answers that he gave you on a range of issues. 
you know, again, we were happy to, to highlight um, the autonomous driving piece. Um, it, you know, it's, it's great to have a company like Tesla where the CEO actually understands the technology well enough. I mean, he spends a lot of time with the autopilot team, as he told us, uh, to be able to answer these questions well. I, I definitely think that's not the case with the traditional auto companies. Um, I, I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done sort of at that executive level at other firms. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we were happy with the outcome. Um, certainly happy that we got to, to spend time with him and uh, ha happy to talk about uh, this story a bit more that we've been focusing on so much. All right. Tasha Keeney, ARK Invest, along with Bloomberg's Craig Trudell. Thank you both. All right, coming up, the latest twist in the winner-take-all bid for a massive Pentagon cloud contract. We talk about why a judge is putting a lawsuit on hold while the investigations unfold. That is next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Disney has pulled its advertising spending from YouTube, joining other companies, including Nestle, after a blogger detailed how comments on Google's video site were being used to facilitate a soft core pedophilia ring. Some of the videos involved ran next to ads placed by Disney and Nestle. Garrett DeVink covers Google at Bloomberg. He joins us now from New York. So, Garrett, this is an absolutely horrifying story that's been bubbling over the last couple of days. What exactly is happening here? So the advertisers, as they've done other times when, you know, questionable content, violent content, content of a sexual nature has shown up next to some of their ads uh, are pulling spend. And when it comes to some of these companies, Nestle and Disney in particular, I mean, we're not sure exactly how much money is involved in this situation. We're hearing that it's, you know, in the low thousands at least. But these companies overall spend millions and millions of dollars on YouTube and on other Google properties all the time. But hang on, there's a pedophilia ring on YouTube? I mean, what exactly are we seeing? It, it, In my understanding, it's, it's comments that are tied to certain videos. Exactly. It, you know, so a big part of this is YouTube's recommendations algorithm. So if a user goes to a video that might be completely inane, such as, you know, a fully grown person talking about, uh, you know, bikinis or swimwear that they bought at a store, not necessarily showing it off in any suggestive way or anything like that, watches that video and then YouTube suggests another video and then another video and pretty soon you have some content that, although not in, you know, explicitly in, in a sexual nature does show underage people wearing, you know, revealing clothing. And then if you scroll down into some of the comment section, you'll see certain people have made comments linking out to specific moments in those videos that, you know, are potentially sexually suggestive. And that's kind of what's been going on. And, you know, these videos have been out there. This was tracked by a YouTube vlogger. He made a very in-depth post explaining how this works that has been viewed over 1.7 million times at this point. And that's why these big advertisers are pausing their spending. So talk to us about the chain of events here, because it certainly sounds like YouTube didn't take action until advertisers spoke up. YouTube went and, you know, quickly disabled commenting on some of the videos that had been pointed out. I'm sure they have a ton of people who are scanning through their library right now, making sure that anything else that is remotely connected to this is either taken down or the comments are taken away. People who were commenting those questionable things have been blocked. But of course, you know, YouTube ha is home to millions and millions of videos and more and more get uploaded every day. And that is, you know, the fundamental platform problem that this company has struggled with, regardless of what kind of content is on there, that there are people who are going to upload things, who are going to comment things that, you know, are not socially acceptable and that are illegal often. And the company needs to chase them. And, and sometimes that content shows up next to ads. They do not watch every video that gets uploaded to their platform before it's, it's sometimes shown next to an ad. All right, well, we'll continue to follow, and I know you'll continue to follow how this one unfolds. Bloomberg's Garrett to Vink, uh, thanks so much for bringing us that update. Meantime, a federal judge has paused a lawsuit over a potential $10 billion cloud computing contract. The contract was a winner-take-all deal that appeared to favor Amazon. But Oracle claimed that the procurement process has been tainted by two DOD officials having ties 
to Amazon. This latest wrinkle comes after the Defense Department said that new information came to light about the allegations. To untangle this, let's go to New York, where Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, uh, who covers corporate influence, joins us. So, Naomi, what are the actual allegations here? I understand it involves at least one Amazon executive who worked for Amazon, then worked for the Defense Department, then worked at a Amazon again, and is accused of influencing the process? Yes. Yeah, so what Oracle claims is that uh, there was a Dep Department of Defense a staffer who essentially worked on the Jedi procurement. And while he was working on the pro procurement, Amazon approached him, uh, suggesting that they were interested in buying his company. Uh, as those conversations were going on, uh, that staffer told his, his uh, bosses, essentially, you know, maybe I should recuse myself from that procurement. Uh, and he later resigned um, as that, those conversations continued and rejoined Amazon. But what Oracle is saying is those, we don't know enough about the, that relationship and how those conversations were proceeding while he was working on the Jedi procurement and helping to uh, make decisions about what kind of strategy the Pentagon would uh, proceed with. So what is the judge saying here? The judge is saying, essentially granting a request from the government, which wants to take some more time to reevaluate whether those conflicts of interest actually impacted the integrity of the procurement. And so the government asked for more time to do this after receiving new information. They didn't disclose what that new information it is, but we do know that it is about potential conflicts of interest. What have Amazon and Oracle had to say since this development? Both companies aren't saying much about this uh, development, but it's obviously a big win for Oracle, um, which has been claiming that the procurement process has been slanted in favor for Amazon for months now. They first filed a challenge to the contract with the Government Accountability Office and lost that. Uh, and then they filed a lawsuit for the federal claims court. And what they're hoping is a judge will send the Pentagon back to the drawing board to redesign the contract in a way that might open up more opportunities for other companies to get involved. So at what point do we expect an actual decision here, given these developments? This has already been going on for a very long time. Yes, and it will probably be going on for quite some more time. The Pentagon previously said that it was going to make a decision to choose a winner for the deal in April. But that timing is a little bit tricky, right? Because they're not likely to make that decision without a ruling from the judge. And a judge has scheduled oral arguments for early April um, and will probably make a decision soon after. Um, but, you know, that decision could affect how the Pentagon chooses its winner. Design, you know, it might have to redesign the procurement. Or, um, you know, what might be more likely is Oracle loses this challenge. Hmm. All right. Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, thank you so much for weighing in. I know you'll continue to chart that path for us. Thank you. Coming up, a major European insurer is placing a billion-dollar bet on tech startups. How it impacts Europe's tech investment landscape is next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Europe's biggest insurer is making sure that it plays a role in the next generation of tech startups. Allianz is increasing the size of its tech investment fund to $1.1 billion, making it one of the largest corporate-backed venture funds in Europe. Here's what the fund's CEO, Nazim Setin, told Bloomberg News about the move. We are kind of spoiled for choice because uh, now with the new fund size, of course, we can increase our investments and also look for other companies. But also, it's not just the investment amount that we have that spoils us for choice. It's more the broader brand of Allianz and the opportunities that we can deliver to the companies with whom we work together. The fund, called Allianz X, currently has about 15 deals to its name, including Money in Gojek, Lemonade, and the German mobile bank N26. To talk about this and the overall tech investment landscape, I want to bring in Shruti Shah. She's currently an entrepreneur in residence at Silicon Valley Bank. So, Shruti, what do you make of an increase in corporate venture of this size in Europe? Yeah, um, well, I think it's a really interesting trend um, that seems to be occurring. I think corporate venture last year in, was about 20% of all um, the deals in Europe, or they were in about 20% of the deals. So there seems to be um, 
a movement in that direction. And traditionally in Europe, um, a lot of the deal sizes have been smaller and the fund sizes have been smaller. And there seems to now be an increase in the size of the fund. For the first year ever, we're seeing about um, we're seeing more $250 million plus funds than um, sub $50 million funds. Are we seeing the same trends in corporate venture in the United States? Um, yes. I mean, corporate venture continues to be a sizable um, piece of the, the venture landscape here. And it's still, in the United States, it's, it's still a, little, a pretty large number um, that I, th I think percentage wise, there seems to be more corporate VC going into deals in Europe. Um, but the number of deals is larger in the United States. So how does that change the competitive landscape in both Europe and the US? Yeah, well, I think you're seeing other types of capital. So um, in the United States specifically, there were about $8,300 million plus deals last year, and only 12 of them were led solely by a venture fund. Um, so that means you're seeing corporate venture, among other types of kind of later stage funding, going into a lot of um, these companies. And I think in Europe, what this allows for is the potential for more acquisitions, um, for a lot of European companies to hold off on having to exit early because they'll be able to raise later stage funding. Now, you work at Silicon Valley Bank, which is not a traditional venture fund, not a traditional bank. How does Silicon Valley Bank fit into Silicon Valley? Yeah, so Silicon Valley Bank is, uh, I think, in a very unique position. We, we bank both um, high growth tech startups and venture capital funds. And, um, we were able to kind of uh, get a pulse on kind of the, the trends that we're seeing um, in both places because um, we can get a lot of, uh, we see a lot of data with our customers. So there's also a number of IPOs on the docket, tech IPOs for this year. What's your outlook on how those companies will perform? Uber, Lyft, Slack, which is you know, filed for a direct listing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it remains to be seen um, what will happen, but I think that there is definitely a lot of buzz around these companies. So how do you think this year is going to be different than last year? Yeah, well, I think there's certainly going to be more IPOs. So there were some IPOs in the U.S. Europe actually had an outsized number of IPOs. There are about 60, I believe 69 companies that IPO'd, three of them with a billion-dollar-plus market cap. Um, in the U.S., there were only, I, I believe it was about two dozen tech IPOs. So I think 2019 seems to be a year where there, there will be potentially more tech IPOs um, as we're kind of getting to the 10 or 12 year mark with some of these companies that need to get liquidity for founders and investors. All right. Shruti Shah, Silicon Valley Bank entrepreneur in residence. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having stopping me. Stopping by. We'll be watching the year to see if your predictions are correct. <laughs> Well, Pinterest is taking measures against misinformation and controversial content. The company says it's halted search results related to vaccinations. This according to the Wall Street Journal. Most images on the platform returns anti-vaccination content, which contradicts long-held medical guidelines. Facebook recently made similar moves on its platform, saying it's considering removing anti-vaccination content from its recommendation systems altogether. Coming up, Apple is said to be combining its iPhone, iPad, and Mac apps. How the development changes are part of a greater plan for its services division next. Plus, with more than three decades of experience leading big tech, Meg Whitman is a Silicon Valley veteran. She gives us her thoughts on the biggest issues facing tech companies today and talks about trade tensions with China. This is Bloomberg. I was actually poor. No foreplay? Eat your bag of lays with a smile on your face. If all the diseases have been taken, I'll, I'll take a tax. An update on a story we've been following. A former Apple lawyer was released on a $500,000 bond after entering a not guilty plea 
to insider trading charges. Jean Daniel Lavoff appeared in federal court in Newark, New Jersey Wednesday, a week after prosecutors said he traded on confidential revenue and earnings filing since 2011. Meantime, in other Apple news, the company wants to make it easier for software developers. The smartphone maker is reportedly planning to combine apps made for the iPhone, iPad, and Mac by 2021. The initiative, codenamed Marzipan, will allow developers to build a single app that works across all devices without needing to submit their work to separate app stores. Joining us to discuss, Paul Sweeney, co-host of Bloomberg Surveillance and Bloomberg Markets for radio. So, Paul... A universal app sounds great. What is the thinking here? I think the thinking here on the part of Apple is we need to make it easier for app uh, developers to develop products and services on the iOS platform, on the Apple platform, uh, across all of the products that, that Apple supports, whether it's the Mac, the iPad, the iPhone. Right now, uh, it's a little bit tricky to uh, develop apps across those platforms. So the reason they want to make it easier for app developers uh, to develop on the Apple platform is because they're trying to drive services revenue for the company. Um, you know, the company announced, uh, pre-announced that week quarter, last quarter, and in large part is because the phone business continues to mature. It is no longer the growth engine for the company. And so investors are increasingly hanging their hats on the growth of the services business. So to the extent that they can drive app revenue, that'll really be supportive of that growth story. So how much re more revenue could something like this drive? Well, it's interesting that the fastest growing part of the apple pie right now is the services revenue. It's only about 15 percent of sales right now, but it's growing uh, very quickly. And I think most investors say in a world where the a uh, phone is a mature product and is not growing. In fact, phone revenue was down in the last quarter for Apple. Uh, they really need to allocate more resources to the services business and, and, and grow that. So, you know, Apple takes, you know, on average about 30 percent of the revenue from an app developer's service or product, uh, and they need to continue to grow that and make it easier for app developers to develop even more services and products. Meantime, Samsung has their big unpacked event today. They've unveiled a whole new phone lineup, uh, phones with 5G, lower cost options, a foldable phone. Is this lineup going to, you know, prove to be incredibly competitive for Apple, given the you know, variety of choice here that you don't get with the iPhone? Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, Samsung remains a, a very strong competitor to Apple, particularly on the lower end of the market. And I think when you think about, um, you know, Samsung has products throughout the price range, but where they're also very good is at the lower end of the uh, price range, where Apple has not been competitive. They have not really put the resources be behind a more competitively priced Apple phone, uh, aside from the XR. So one of the uh, products that Samsung came out today is a, is a very high quality product at the lower end of the market that is designed to compete against the XR. And that's an area where I think Samsung feels like they have uh, some room to grow. How bullish are you, Paul, on foldable phones? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, what's old is, is new again. And I think, you know, uh, all the phone operators are trying to figure out, you know, they're since the market is becoming increasingly saturated, they are now segmenting the market ever more finely to try to find areas of growth. And to the extent that people want, uh, you know, a foldable phone, um, Samsung thinks there's, there's demand there. Meantime, Apple has had a number of leadership changes, and we can look at some of these changes for signals on you know, where they believe the future is going to be. They've replaced their head of retail. A Angela Arendt uh, uh, is leaving. They promoted the head of people to that job. They've promoted the head of AI, John Gian Andrea, to the head of machine learning. Uh, another executive, Frank Casanova, going to be focusing on AR. Um, what signals do you take away here? The signals I take away is uh, they are recognizing that the future of this company is not just hardware, the phones, the iPads. It's in uh, AI. It's in augmented reality. Um, it's in machine learning. It's in some of, uh, you know, the cloud businesses. So less on the hardware side of the business and more on kind of the software side of the business, uh, big data, cloud computing. And I think that is one of the areas where I think we're starting to see them reallocate not just financial resources in terms of CapEx, uh, but also people as well. All right. Bloomberg's Paul Sweeney, thank you so much for weighing in there. Appreciate it. Well, despite starting three years behind the U.S. in developing a technology industry, China now boasts some of the world's biggest companies in the field. There's, of course, Alibaba with its mammoth e-commerce operations, Tencent and its WeChat social network with one billion users, and Baidu, which has a stranglehold on Internet search. 
Now, China's internet users make up more than double the entire U.S. population. Bloomberg takes a look back at how the internet took hold in China. Imagine if the internet took hold in China. Imagine how freedom would spread. Unrestricted internet access is a source of strength. That country has some of the toughest internet restrictions in the world. Government in China is tightening up on internet restrictions, it says, because of the number of anonymous postings that poke fun at the government. So you think they're ultimately going to be on the right side of history, the Chinese government? Up yours. I am 100% for sure, because nobody can stop this technology revolution. It's 1987 in West Germany, and a university professor has just got an email. It contains one short sentence. Across the Great Wall, we can reach every corner of the world. He's just received the first email from China. China is embracing the reform and opening up policies, and the internet and transparency of information is part of that policy. But it isn't until 1994 that the internet becomes available to the public under the presidency of Jiang Zemin. Like many of his compatriots, Zhang is deeply influenced by the work of Alvin Toffler, an American writer whose book Future Shock predicts a super-industrial revolution brought about by the moderation and regulation of technology. Computers combine facts to make new knowledge at such high speed that we cannot absorb it. But computers are expensive, and hardly anyone owns one. So the Internet Cafe is born. It costs around 25 yuan, or $3 for an hour. In the early days, internet speed was really slow, and having a personal computer was a luxury. Most of the people who frequent internet cafes were the more young, tech-savvy generation, and they would go to play games and chat with their friends anonymously online. In 1995, a former English teacher called Jack Ma heads to the U.S. on business. While he's there, he does a web search for the word beer, and there are no results about China. He returns home and starts an online Yellow Pages. You don't make any money. You've got extraordinary claims, and yet you make nothing. That's internet. By 1999, the company Tencent releases OICQ, and Jack Ma creates Alibaba. It's the millennium and the unveiling of the Golden Shield project, which includes a new surveillance system made up of content filtering firewalls. The system becomes known around the world as the Great Firewall of China. The government also employs an army of people that actively send out social posts to shape conversations online. And these people became known as the 50 Cent Party, the joke being that they would earn 50 cents every time they sent it out a social media post. It only takes a couple more years for China to overtake the U.S. and have the world's most internet users. Fast forward and it's 2012. Xi Jinping is elected General Secretary of the Communist Party with a vision of cyber sovereignty, protecting the country's internet from foreign influence. Notable restrictions include Winnie the Pooh because of comparisons made to Xi Jinping and the letter N. The West might think of Chinese entering it users as being horribly miserable because they can't access information freely, but the truth can't be more different. China's younger generations are perfectly happy living inside the firewall where they can use the domestic apps that are screened. There really is a disconnect between uh, China's younger internet users and the rest of the world because of the Great Firewall. It doesn't take long for controversial new laws which ensure cybersecurity to appear. These grant the government unprecedented access to foreign companies, including their hardware and sensitive user data. In 2018, Freedom House named China as the worst country in the world for online freedom. But China soon starts exporting its take on the internet to countries like Vietnam, Uganda, and Tanzania. In 1987, when that email was sent from China to West Germany, it said across the Great Wall, we can reach every corner of the world. It looks quite ironic right now because we have a Great Wall that literally screens and monitors everything. The vision that early internet founders had is very different from China's internet landscape today. 
Just visit Bloomberg.com to watch that piece along with many, many more. Still ahead, former Hewlett Packard and eBay CEO Meg Whitman is taking her leadership expertise to video streaming. She tells us about the new short video platform, Quibi, where she's the founding CEO and weighs in on the big tech landscape. This is Bloomberg. Meg Whitman is turning her expertise to Hollywood as the CEO of Quibi, a new short-form video platform startup founded by Jeffrey Katzenberg. For the latest episode of Studio 1.0, Bloomberg Studio 1.0, I sat down with Whitman to discuss the new service. It's so easy to um, look at these companies and then now say, well, where did they go wrong? Um, listen, when you are growing at that rate, you have become so ubiquitous. You do the best job you can at the time, and sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes you don't see things as clearly as you might have. And the question is, you will make mistakes. Now the question is, how fast do you fix them? And, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. But I think there's certainly a commitment from the top of that company to fix some of the mistakes that they, you know, have acknowledged making. You navigated a historic split at HP. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of these companies, these big tech companies, are too big for their yeah. own good? I don't know. I mean, I felt certainly that HP had to be broken into smaller, more nimble pieces. You know, there was a time for a big IT supermarket, you know, in the 80s and 90s where tech spending was, you know, rocketing. But then there comes a time where an industry shifts and I think you become too big to be nimble enough to fight off the competitors that are now disrupting you. And that's what we saw at HP. I think when industries get quite mature or there's a different life cycle that you're faced with, then sometimes smaller is better, not always is bigger better. So we'll see. I don't think the same thing is driving this right now. This is more, you know, people are asking, is it just too big because there's, you know, too much power consolidated in these companies? That's different than what we faced at HP. Do you think regulation is a real threat to these companies? So um, I think that the government is very interested in these companies. And, um, you know, having been a politician, what I will tell you is politicians, you know, they see something happen and then their instinct is, OK, what should we be doing to regulate that industry or protect consumers? And that instinct isn't necessarily wrong. They have to know what they're doing and they have to be thoughtful about it. But, you know, there may be a role for some regulation. So of the sort of big tech companies, where do you see the biggest risk? Well, I will tell you, tech is moving at lightning speed. I've never seen anything quite like this. You know, I think in my early days of my career, you had sort of, you know, you'd see trends coming and you had a year or two or three to adapt. Now you have a month or two <laughs> or three to adapt. I think the biggest challenge is the time of innovation has shrunk dramatically. And you just see these new companies come out of, any, come out of nowhere that disrupt the very thing that you thought was safe. Are Facebook and Apple and Google, are they disruptable? Amazon? You know, I suspect they are. Okay, so, you know, Jeff Bezos has said someday Amazon will be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you read about Sears today. And Sears 100 years ago was the Amazon of that time. And, you know, they've been disrupted. You know, business is Darwinian. There's no question about it. When you were running eBay, mm -hmm. you made a pledge to win China. Well, yes. Alibaba won China, and actually no U.S. tech company has really won China. eBay didn't, Amazon didn't. You are right about that. You said whoever wins China wins the world. Mm. Is, is China as important today as it was back then? I think China is very important. And you may know that our uh, joint venture partner in China is likely to be Alibaba. And um, I'm just glad to be on the same side as them this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge film market, yes, yes. but it's also been difficult for yes, U.S. this it U.S. Has. entertainment industry to crack. I mean, China is a very unique market. And I think, you know, it's, it's unwise, I think, to try to think about going to China alone. I mean, I lived in China for four months when I was trying to fix eBay in China, and it's just completely different. And so having a strong partner who understands that market, I think, is, is really important. So what will Alibaba provide? They have, you know, tremendous scale in China. I mean, it's remarkable um, how much they have grown in the last 20 years and obviously have a platform um, called Yuku. They have, you know, uh, Alibaba Pictures. They have, you know, music. They've got a lot of entertainment properties that, that hopefully we can leverage, and they have remarkable technology. What's your take on the U.S.-China trade tensions yeah, yeah. as we sit here in the middle of a trade war? Yeah. Well, um, I think maybe you know this about me. I, I tend to be a free trader. 
you know, I think global trade, while there is dislocation associated with global trade, is actually the right thing to do. And, you know, you want it to be a level playing field, and I'm certain there's some things we can do better with China, but honestly, the free movement of goods and ideas and trade has always been the right thing for the United States. So and what's at stake? Well, I think, you know, listen, I think we have to be there very thoughtful. They are the second largest economy in the world. There's lots of things that we should be doing together. Is it good for every single person in every single community? No, but overall, it's the right thing to do. And then we as a country have to keep our eyes on what are the next industries, what are the growth industries, whether it's immunotherapy or 3D printing or robotics or AI. Let's make sure that we are the best in the world at the industries of the future. Um, because that's always been what has made America great. My interview there with Quibi CEO Meg Whitman. You can catch the full interview on Bloomberg Studio 1.0 tonight, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are live streaming on Twitter. You can always check us out at Technology. And follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.